Good to go. All right. <laughs> so you all know who I am by now. You've seen me before. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, furthering our stroll through the forest of algebraic geometry today. And <laughs> too much. I think it's too much. No, that's it, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're continuing with sheaves. And we are eventually going to get past sheaves. We're going to see the bigger picture. Um, but for now, we're going to tie up a couple loose ends that came up in the last two, uh, last two meetings. So there is something Anton hinted at at the end of last talk about, um, well, all of Anton's talk was about this interface between understanding sheaves and understanding the germs or the stalks of the sheaves. And uh, Anton mentioned a result last time that you can detect that a morphism of sheaves is an isomorphism by checking that the induced morphisms on all the stocks are isomorphisms. So the first thing I'm going to do is provide a proof of that because it's an interesting way of recapping everything we've been doing about this interface between sheaves and their stocks. And the other thing is I'm going to tie up a little hint that Pat had left at the end of his last talk, which was this problem with the, the notion of a co-kernel for sheaves. So Pat had mentioned we can take, uh, if you have a morphism of sheaves, you can do a kernel construction which in the naive way, you just take the kernel of all the, all the maps for every open set, and this works out. If we have a morphism of sheaves, we get that the kernel is itself a sheaf. But if you try and do this naive thing for co-kernels, it turns out that it doesn't always work. If we have two sheaves and a morphism between them, the co-kernel is not always a sheaf. It might be merely a pre-sheaf. So this is perfect motivation for this introduction of sheafification. This is a name I think Ravi Vakil just cooked up out of nowhere. I haven't heard it anywhere else. But it's this magic wand we can wave at a pre-sheaf and uh, turn it into a sheaf. We, we associate a sheaf with it in a natural way. And this is how we're going to fix the co-kernel. You just take the naive co-kernel and wave the wand, and then you get a sheaf. And that's what you're going to call the co-kernel. And it works out that in the category theory sense, this satisfies the universal property of co-kernels in the category of sheaves. So it's the thing we want to be the co-kernel. All right, so that's where we're headed. So let's start with the first thing I said, which is this interface between sheaves and their stocks. So we're just going to fix a topological space X. That's where all our sheaves are going to be defined. So let F and G be sheaves on X in whatever category you like to consider, rings, abelian groups. We're going to use abelian groups specifically later on, but we can be general for now. So uh, we're going to let phi from f to g be a morphism. So as a reminder of what that is, we just bundled together a whole bunch of morphisms for all the open sets. sections over every open set for all open U, and these play nicely with our restriction maps. Which just means that if I have U and V that are open sets, say V is contained in U, if I apply phi of U and then restrict to V, it's the same as if I had restricted to V first and then applied phi V. So we want to understand this morphism in terms of in the induced morphism you get from the stocks. So for every point, in our space, we can induce a map from one stock to another. And the way we define this thing is sort of the natural way you would try and do it. So elements of this stock, FP, look like ordered pairs, an open set, and then some section of the sheaf over that open set. So we have a map associated to the open set, so you would naively just want to do this. Apply the map we have. And you can do all the checking, not too hard, that this is well defined. If I change the representative of the ordered pair, I'm going to get the same result under the equivalence relation on GP. So these are the induced morphisms. And we can say things about phi by saying things about phi p. That's the moral of the story here. So here's the theorem. C 
So phi is an isomorphism if and only if each phi p is an isomorphism. So it might be easier sometimes to check that all the stock induced stock morphisms are isomorphisms, and then this is useful. Or you can prove that your morphism is not an isomorphism by proving that for some stock, that's not an isomorphism. So if Bakil calls this a tricky theorem, but there's really only one part of the proof that's tricky. So this is a bi-directional thing, and one direction is very easy. What's that? The other is tricky. <laughs> well, only half of the other direction is tricky. So if, uh, if phi is the one that's an isomorphism with some inverse, well, I can get an induced morphism at every point for the inverse map. It's easy to check that if you induce the morphism, the inverse morphism at every point, that's going to invert the induced morphism for phi. So the induced morphism phi p inverse is phi inverse of p. And you can just use the explicit definition of this induced map to do the job. So that's not hard. But going the other way, here's where the fun begins. So is everyone cool with that, by the way? If there's anything I need to uh, clarify, just interrogate me, prod me, question me. So if each phi p is an isomorphism, so we want to show that phi is. And because of the way phi works, since we just bundle together morphisms for every open set, it suffices to invert the morphism on every open set. Because then my inverse morphism will be I just bundle together all the inverse morphisms over every open set. And this plays nicely with restriction. You can just write down the commutative diagram for phi u and phi v and like write out the map composition. And then invert. If you invert the equation that it satisfies, it shows that the inverse also makes the diagram commute. So that happens automatically. So we only have to invert each of these. And for our entire lives, we're working in categories where we can deal with elements and talk about, so in particular, these things are isomorphisms exactly when they're injective and surjective maps. So that's the way we're going to be doing it. OK. So we show phi u is injective first. This is not bad. We just have to write down this magic commutative diagram. So I have my map that goes across. And then Anton talked about last time we get this map that goes into the product of the stocks at all the points in U. So it just takes some element f up here down to, you just map it to this natural tuple fu over all the points. And same over here. So from last time, we saw that if f and g are sheaves, these are embeddings. They're injective maps. And that follows from the identity axiom. That was the only thing we used in the argument. So now, we're assuming that each of these phi p's is an isomorphism. Well, if I have a product of these, I can string together all the maps get a product map of the phi p's, where you just apply phi p in every coordinate corresponding to p. And if each of these phi p's is an isomorphism, then this product map is likewise an isomorphism. 
So to check injectivity of phi u, I'm going to use this handy diagram. I just have to show that if I have two elements here, they're going to map to, and if they map to the same element here, then they were the same back here. But if you stare at the diagram, you can convince yourself of this. So this is injective, and this map is injective too because it's an isomorphism. So if I have two elements here, and I map them over here, well, I just carry on down here. And because the diagram commutes, they have the same image here. And that was injective, so they had to be equal here. So hopefully without writing anything down, I've just convinced you that this was injective. So that one's not so bad. Surjectivity is going to be where we have fun. OK. Get rid of this for the moment. So I want to take an element that lives here and find a preimage. That's all I need to do. We're going to find the preimage by going all the way around the diagram the long way. And properties of sheaves are going to help us at every step lift things to where they need to go. So we'll take an arbitrary element in here. And then we map it to the natural thing down here. All right. Haven't done anything fancy yet. But we use the fact that this is an isomorphism now. So I can find a preimage for this over here. So I'm just going to abbreviate my equivalence class of ordered pairs by FP at every point for now. So I want to choose my representatives in a nice way, because I eventually want to get myself a pre-image up here. And the way we want to do this, because we have a sheaf, is I want to glue the representatives in some way. Glueability should be able to give us a lifting up here. So let's just start by taking any representative, and then I'm going to fine tune the representative in a moment. Yeah, they're all compatible germs. You could perhaps check that this is compa a compatible family, but I think what I'm doing is roughly analogous to it. Okay. I think that is an intuition at least. Like, you have a compatible family down there, you have an isomorphism. So. <laughs> it should preserve compatible families, yeah. Yeah, I think what I'm going to be doing is roughly this compatibility check. I can certainly represent it as some ordered pair. I've got an FP tilde and then a neighborhood of P. So we do this for every point. And then we look at what it means for it to map to this over here. So we know. that uh, phi p of this pair is a g u at every point. Now I have a definition for this map. So I just apply phi u p to f p tilde. And then by the definition of the equivalence relation then, if I restrict to a small enough open set, then they will agree. So there exists, say, VP open phi UP of FP tilde restricted to VP is G restricted to VP for every point. 
Now, I don't want to have to run through this intermediate restriction. So we can replace our representative with one for which we don't have to restrict. So this fp tilde up is equal to fp tilde restricted to vp vp. So I'm just going to use these instead. So then without loss of generality, if I just use these representatives, I can say that uh, phi up of fp tilde is actually g restricted to up for all points. OK. So now I have an open cover of these UPs. I cover U. And then I have a section over every open set. So I want to glue them. So what I need is that FP tilde restricted to the intersection of UP and UQ for any two points. That's my shorthand for that intersection. Is FQ tilde restricted to the intersection? If I can verify this, I can glue them. And hopefully that's the pre-image that we're after. So the trick I'm going to use is we know that we've already proved each of these phi U's as an injective map. So it'll actually be easier to check that the images of these two elements are the same. And then, because it's injective, they had to be the same. So we check that phi upq of this thing is phi upq of the other one. by injectivity of the map, this is enough. But we know that these play nicely with restriction. So this is what happened when I restricted first and then applied the corresponding map. So what if I apply the map first and then restrict? Well, then I get 5 up of fp tilde restricted to upq. But I just said that this was just g restricted to up. further restricted to UPQ. So this is just G restricted to UPQ. But of course, the same thing works on this side. I just use Q instead of P. So we're good. We have glueability. The glueability condition is satisfied. So glue the FP tilde to get some F. F restricted to UP equal to FP tilde for all P. So we, we want this to be our preimage. We've lifted this family up to some F. And then I just want to map it to G. So the claim is phi U of F equals G. But again, I have an injective map here. So it's going to be easier to check that they map to the same thing down here, and then I'll use injectivity to conclude that they're the same. Their natural images in, in that product are just this tuple of phi u f u. Yes. Overall p. So just point for point, I have to check that these two germs are the same. But I can just use the fact that my diagram commuted. So we've got phi u of f u. Well, I can restrict down and not change anything. So this is phi u of f restricted to up on up. And then this is phi up of f p 
tilde, which is f restricted to up. And that is phi p of this element fp from earlier, because I was just a representative for fp. And that is g u. So we've checked. In fact, it does map. Or they do map to the same thing in the product, so then they're actually the same. Everyone follow that? Or is there anything else I need to, to go into? OK. So this was a nice little tour through uh, the interface between sheaves and their stocks. <coughs> so that's my first trick for today. So now we're going to move on to the path. I just, I just want to, like, for kill points, is so something that is worth. Um, what, what the theorem doesn't say is that if you have isomorphic stocks, then the sheaves are isomorphic. Yes. So that's, I don't know, that's kind of subtle. So I mean, yeah, it's, it's a good thing to warn about. Yeah. So yeah, you can't just take any old isomorphisms between the sheaves or between the stocks and conclude that you have an isomorphism up top. This is, this is specifically for the induced morphisms you get from your, your initial morphism. And we've used that really heavily all the way through this proof. Yeah, no worries. Good point. OK. So sheaf co-kernels. So like I said, the naive approach is we just would like to do the co-kernel on for every map over every open set. So just for those of you who haven't seen a co-kernel in a while, just remind you what it is when we have like a map of R modules. So if little phi from m to n is an R module homomorphism. So it also works for abelian groups if you use z as your ring. The co-kernel of phi is just the codomain of the map modulo the image of that map. And it deserves the name co-kernel for the general category theory reason that whenever you throw co in front of something, it just means you've reversed the arrows. So kernels satisfy a certain universal property. And if you reverse the, all the arrows in the universal property for the kernel, you get a universal property satisfied by this thing. So that's why we call it the co-kernel. So we'd like to do this construction for sheaves as well. So if uh, phi from f to g so I'm going to assume it's a morphism of sheaves. This works for pre-sheaves too. But the failure only happens when it's sheaves. So we take proper notation for what I'm doing is a co -cur pre, because this will be a co-kernel for pre-sheaves. So it's going to be at least a pre-sheaf, which I'll define on every open set to be the naive thing you would get on every open set. So the codomain of the map phi u, which is just going to be g u modulo the image of that map phi u. Of course, I need enough structure in my sheaves for this to work. So we're going to deal with sheaves of abelian groups for our discussion. And then I can actually make this make sense. So then I need restriction maps. But the restriction maps are going to be the naive restriction maps. So if I want to take uh, something in here, which will look like a coset of uh, the image of 5u, I want to restrict it to some subset v. I just restrict g to v. and use the same coset. And this will be well defined because these morphisms phi u and phi v commute with restriction. That's something you can check. But. So we certainly get as far as getting a pre-sheaf out of this, which is cool. But unlike the kernel, coker pre of phi need not be a sheaf. So we're going to see an example where this 
fails. And this comes straight out of complex analysis. So we're going to take uh, the complex numbers as our topological space for the moment with its usual topology. So we're going to consider a short exact sequence of pre-sheaves. So we have our old friend, the constant sheaf associated to Z, which can be seen as continuous maps from the complex numbers to Z, integer valued continuous functions. Then a sheaf I'll tell you about shortly, and another pre-sheaf that I'll tell you about shortly. Okay. So this is the constant sheaf for Z. This is the sheaf of holomorphic functions. Yes. Yeah, as that comes with the discrete topology. Well, you're just going to get locally constant ones out of that, yeah. So OX is the sheaf of holomorphic functions. So there on any open set, you're just looking at the functions that are holomorphic on that open set. Restriction being just ordinary restriction of functions. And we can, we can add any two of these functions point-wise and get a new holomorphic function, so we get a sheaf of abelian groups. Now this F is going to be... I haven't argued why this is a sheaf. I'll come back to that in a second. Pre-sheaf of functions with holomorphic logs. So if I can take the log of the function and that log is holomorphic on the open set, then I've got a valid thing in my pre-sheaf. And then again, restriction will just be ordinary restriction of your functions. And, but here the group operation is a little different. So instead of adding the functions pointwise, you multiply them pointwise. And that's just because if I have f and g that have holomorphic logs, then the product fg has a holomorphic log given by log f plus log g. Okay. So that's the setup. So this is a pre-sheaf, but I want to just say a few words about why this is a sheaf. So the identity axiom, we've done examples like this before. We just have functions from some set to some other set. And you just restrict the functions. The identity axiom is an immediate thing. Glueability is almost an immediate thing. You just have to make sure that when you glue, you get something that satisfied the adjectives you threw in front of your function. So if I glue a bunch of functions that are locally holomorphic, that agree on overlaps, the glued function is going to be holomorphic because holomorphic functions are, by definition, differentiable on some neighborhood of the point at every point. So it's an open set condition, so we're just going to get a holomorphic function when we glue. Okay. So we have two maps, which I haven't mentioned yet. We have this I and E. So I is going to be an inclusion. So we just include Z bar U into OX U for each U. Because any of these continuous functions from, from the complex numbers to Z, integer value continuous functions are automatically holomorphic because they have derivative zero at every point in some neighborhood of the point. Then the other map, E, I'll just say what it is in terms of every open set over to here. Well, I'll just take my function f of z and I take it to this exponential. And then I've produced something with a holomorphic log, namely 2 pi i f of z. So I just have to convince you this is an exact sequence. So what's the word 2 pi i? Can you do the f of z? I've rigged it so that the kernel of this uh, 
of this map is going to be exactly Z. That's the only reason for that. So hopefully I don't have to convince you that inclusion is injective. IU is injective for all you. <laughs> so at every open set then, the sequence is exact at Z bar. And then this is surjective at every open set. Because if I have some function in here, and I write down its holomorphic log, then H certainly lives back here. And I can look at what I map it to. So I can take H of Z over 2 pi i is in OXU and EU of that is, is G. Because you're just going to get E to the log, which is just G. What's that? Is a log multivalued function complex analysis? Yeah, it's just. We're just um, enforcing that it has a holomorphic branch of the logarithm. So you just choose one branch of the log. And then. So for instance, when I'm doing it here, I'm fixing a fixed, fixed branch of log, and then I get this. Well, so all, we're, all we are uh, asserting is that there exists a holomorphic log so that there exists a branch of the log function that's holomorphic on the open set. Is it necessarily a closed interval product then? Because you have different branches. Well, you just choose, like you just add the two branches that correspond to the. Yeah. I think it should work. If you see a problem, let me know afterwards. But <laughs> OK. So we've got this, and then I just have to say that the kernel of EU is exactly Z bar of U. Well, since we're dealing with uh, multiplication as a group operation, one is our identity on this sheaf. So something in the kernel. It's equivalent to saying that e to the 2 pi i f of z is 1 everywhere in our open set. But because of the way exponential functions work, this is equivalent to f of z being an integer for all z. Otherwise, I'm not going to get 1. f is holomorphic, in particular continuous. And because of that, and because the continuous ones that are integer valued are automatically holomorphic, this is equivalent to saying that f was actually in z bar of u. So we get exactness at the final place. OK. So where does the co-kernel come in? Well, I've now got you an exact sequence, and I pointed out that this f is not a sheaf. Or I haven't yet. Aha. <laughs> That's the missing piece. <laughs> f is not a sheaf. So it fails glueability. So we're going to consider the identity function on various chunks of the complex plane. I'll just draw the pictures of them. So we have the upper half plane, the right half plane, lower half plane, and left half plane. 
So I can define a holomorphic log z on any open half plane. That's just elementary complex analysis. But if I try and glue this function into a function defined on all four of these half planes at the same time, I would have to use, since the values have to be the same, I'd have to use z on the whole plane. So log z is not holomorphic. on the glued set, C minus the origin. We always have a branch cut problem, a jump, a discontinuity somewhere. So I can't glue this function. So we don't have a sheaf. So now, now I can say why the co-kernel fails. So we look at the co-kernel of that inclusion map I that I drew in the short exact sequence. this naive co-kernel. Well, for any open set u, it's just uh, oops, ox of u modulo the image of the inclusion map, which is this. And first isomorphism theorem gives us an isomorphism with fu. So if you treat quotient pre-sheaves in the natural way, you get a sheaf isomorphism here, which was a co-kernel of i, which is not a sheaf, even though it was a map between sheaves. So this is why we need to fix it. This is what sheafification is for. Okay. So before we dive into the uh, details, I'm going to give you the universal property of this thing, and we can draw lots of really nice consequences out of it right off the bat. And I should pause and ask if there's anything I can clarify beyond what I just said. Everyone's good? OK. So the magic wand, turning pre-sheaves into sheaves. So we're going to let f be a pre-sheaf on x. So what is the sheafification of f? Is, oh, I forgot an if. Sheafif, sheafication. Well, that's shorter to say. <laughs> Sheafification. <laughs> okay, is a sheaf, should be a sheaf somewhere, which I'll denote f sheaf. And then we're going to get a map. So we get a map uh, sheaf from f to f sheaf. And it's going to satisfy a certain property. This is going to look a bit like the universal property of free groups, free algebras, free objects in general. So I've got this map from f to the sheaf of occasion, and if I'm given any sheaf g and any morphism from f into g in the category of pre-sheaves, there should be a unique map here, call it g, from f sheaf to g that makes the diagram commute. OK, so as long as this exists, we can say lots of nice things about it. So first remark. Now this is general category theory drivel. The things that satisfy universal properties are usually unique up to unique isomorphism. standard proof. 
if you, uh, if any of you need to see it, just let me know afterwards and we can do it. Okay. But this uniqueness then tells us something. If I try and sheafify a sheaf, then I don't add anything, which is good because we don't really want to make a different sheaf. So if f is a sheaf, f sheaf is isomorphic to f. And why is that? Well, f satisfies this universal property. If I just use the identity map from f to f here, and I put f here, then if I have any morphism to G, call it F, then I just put F here. And that's got to be the unique morphism that's going to make this diagram commute. So the isomorphism is immediate. OK, and then the third thing, which is nice as well, is that, uh, aha, I got both ifs, is a functor. from the category of pre-sheaves to the category of sheaves. So the assignment for objects is I'm just going to take a pre-sheaf and sheafify it. And then what I'm going to do for morphisms, now suppose I have a morphism downstairs between f and g. Well, I can certainly boost these to sheaves. These are the various sheafification maps. And now I can invoke the universal property we have here. So if I look at phi composed with sheafification, I can use that as my f, and that's a map into a sheaf. So there's got to be a unique morphism across, which I'll call phi sheaf, that'll make this commute. So that's the assignment. And you can check that uh, it takes the identity map to the identity map and respects compositions. It's just a routine uh, diagram chasing type exercise. Okay, so there's some nice things about it. So I'll leave this for a second because that is my final remark. So four, how do we get the co-kernel? We're going to set uh, co cur, co kernel of phi. Like I said, we take the naive co kernel and sheafify it. And this will satisfy that universal property for co kernels in the category of sheaves. Vakil actually has the proof in his notes, so I don't think it's worthwhile actually doing it. You can just look at it. He's got nice diagrams. You just combine the universal property of this chiefification with the universal property for co-kernels and pre-sheaves and everything works. So I do have time to start constructing this chiefification. So it exists for every pre-sheaf we care to name. This ties back into something from Anton's talk last time. The way in which we build a sheafification for a pre-sheaf is you look at all of the compatible families of germs associated with your pre-sheaf. So given f, well, I want to build my sheaf, so I have to give what it looks like over every open set. And this is a bunch of tuples of germs over u, and have the following property. This is that compatibility property. So for all points, there exists some open neighborhood of p, and then a representative in f of up. such that if I look at this, uh, this section's natural representative in all the stocks, fp tilde up 
that's equal to fq for all q, and I should say that's in fq for all q in up. That's that mouthful definition. But it's just saying that, so I have this tuple of germs over points in U. And if I just look at any given point, question? Over or U? Because I'm doing, it's describing what happens over every open set so U. Afterwards, you write the DNX. Oh, okay, yes. That's the one. Yeah, at any point I can find you some local representative such that when I look at the representative of this thing and all of those germs, they're going to agree with locally with the tuple. This one's a hard one to say out loud. When you just look at, look at what it means and think about it for a while, you understand what's going on. But this is what a compatible family of germs is. Most of this machinery is not going to be used in actually verifying that this is a sheaf or anything, but this is, this is our groundwork. So I have to give you restriction maps too. So V is contained in U. Then if I take one of these compatible families that runs over all the points in U, and I want to restrict it to V, I just forget about all the things that don't live in V, and I just look at the tuple of things that live in V. And then that will be, that'll be a restriction map according to the conditions we've imposed. So importantly, I need this to be a sheaf. So we need identity and glueability. So let's take a bunch of open sets covering a given open set. And then I've got two of these tuples. FP, GP in here that restrict to the same things. for all UI. Well, what does equality between the tuples mean? That just says that FP equals GP for all points in UI. This is true for all the UI. Every point lives in some UI, so we conclude that FP equals GP for all P in U which is the same as saying that those were the same. So there's the identity axiom, which used nothing about the compatibility of this at all. It was just we had a tuple, and I restricted them. Now we glue them. So now we'll take that same open cover. And then I've got these tuples running over UI. And I want to glue them if they agree on overlaps. So FP restricted to oops, intersection of UI and UJ. Oh, 
yeah, OK. I need better notation than I'm using. This runs over ui, and this one runs over uj. Ah, oh, geez, OK. Maybe I'll call it fip. There we go. The notation's worse than the argument, honestly. OK. So I want to glue these to a big tuple. So I'm going to take uh, this global thing, FP, by for each point. I'm just going to set it to be fpi if p is in ui. Because I have a representative there. And this is an unambiguous definition because if p lives in ui and uj, this restriction condition says that fpi is equal to fpj. So this is the same thing. So one checks that. Uh, this FP is compatible. And that just ends up producing to compatibility over every open set. It's not terribly enlightening to do that check, so I'll just take it for granted. So we can glue. And I'll call it quits there. So I'll leave it to Deanna to do the, uh, the fact that this satisfies the universal property that we have going on here. But we at least know that we can build a sheaf associated with f. So we've halfway constructed the sheafification. All right. Thanks. Anybody have any questions? I have, I have one question. Maybe, maybe this doesn't need to be By all means. Um, I don't know if you've thought about this. If you've even thought about it, maybe let's not do this. Fakil says, let's not worry about where the empty set goes. <laughs> is there is there some if we like restrict to like a nice sheep, is there some obvious thing? Because you get like the empty product, right? Do you Yeah, okay. Right? Because I have to send that somewhere. So that set just where's that going? Did you I, I don't know if you haven't thought about this, this is not the time to do it perhaps, but You will naturally would, you'd want to send it to just some zero object. Yeah, that's like the, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah, if you're oops, I guess you just get the zero. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well. That's not a real question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All right. Okay. Same thing again.